Thank you very much, um, first of all, for inviting me to be with you. Um, and, and I'm really sorry that I couldn't be, actually, I'm really sorry for me that I couldn't be in Hong Kong because um, Hong Kong is one of my favorite places to visit and one of my favorite places to go eating. Uh, it has some of the best food in the world. Um, I, uh, what I would like to do today is um, I'm not going to have a PowerPoint. Um, and if you feel that I'm speaking too fast, which I, some, which I sometimes do, if you could just please write in the chat and I'll try and slow down. Um, what I want to do today is to touch briefly on why I came to do this project, because as Professor Palmer's introduction made clear, I have done a lot of different things about the Middle East. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll focus a little bit on what I think is distinctive about sinews of war and trade. And finally, I'll focus on the three different aspects, which I think are quite significant and important in thinking about maritime transportation in the Arabian Peninsula. And those are those that were listed and um, which um, Jules kindly enumerated. That's colonialism, labor, struggle, labor struggles, and war. Um, Although my uh, project does not directly touch on questions of religion, which is something that um, is particularly relevant to um, those in this, uh, those that are sitting in on this lecture, I'll be happy to answer questions about those in the Q and A. Okay, so um, I came to this project uh, quite. Um, by accident, um, quite by happy accident. Um, as I was uh, completing the research for my project on counterinsurgency, I spoke to uh, a US military officer that had been involved in the US war in Iraq. And one of the things that he said to me, I, this, this was part of the interview that I was conducting. One of the things that he said to me was, you academics and journalists, what you're always interested in is the bloody part of War. What you should actually look at is where the money comes from and how uh, material gets to the war. Um, and so essentially what he was pointing me to was military logistics. And that sounded really interesting to me. You know, I had worked on the discourses of war in my first project, on the practices of war in the second project. And in both of those, I had been very interested in the way that transnational movement um, of ideas of military personnel, of military doctrine, of forms of mobilization, of dissent actually moved across the globe. So it seemed to me that um, focusing also on um, the movement of cargo and capital across global boundaries would be something that could be of quite a bit of interest. Around the same time, a friend of mine who works for International Transport Workers Federation, the global union representing dock workers and seafarers, um, was talking to me and he suggested that perhaps I should start looking at the way that labor processes um, are taking place in the Arabian Peninsula. And in part, that was because this, so much of the focus, of course, of the global union is on other places, partially, for example, China um, and Southeast Asia, um, and, and partially because um, of I speak Arabic, I speak Persian, and, and, I, and this friend knew I was looking for a research project. So it, it, it's by, it was by completely happy happenstance that I came to the idea of working on war and labor in the Arabian Peninsula maritime transportation. Originally, I also wanted to sort of work on um, the questions of uh, supply chain logistics and using the sort of the supply chain literature as a, as a way into this project. But the more that I read about it, the more it became clear to me that actually infrastructures, so the sort of the fixed assets around which the processes of capital investment for maritime transport happens, and which actually make possible the global trade in goods um, and the movement of capital, those infrastructures were what I um, was particularly interested in. In part, that might might have also been because I, in my undergraduate degree, I trained as an engineer. And so um, I have, although I then went on to do humanities and social sciences, um, I've always been interested in the sort of the fixed structures that shape our world. Now, what is distinctive about the book that came out of that project um, is uh, several things. First, um, like the great historian of Indian Ocean, Michael Pearson, I wanted the project to be amphibian, 
I wanted it to both look at the sea from the shore and to look at the shore from the sea. I wanted to be able to cover both aspects of that because in a sense, we cannot speak about infrastructures without actually looking both outwards and towards the hinterland, in particular maritime infrastructures. So that was one of the things that I thought, um, one of the guiding principles of um, my methodology. A second element that I was really interested in, um, in this project was that I really wanted to write something different about the Arabian Peninsula. A lot of people who write about Arabian Peninsula have particular sets of cliches that they kind of attend to. Some of those is sort of the literature of frontierism, which uh, around oil, which tends to overwhelm almost everything else. And although there have been critiques posed of the Rantier economy literature, it seems to still be very prevalent. I wanted to write something that looks at the economies of these places and that does not necessarily follow the sort of the, the contours of Rantier state theory. The second kind of uh, set of literatures that I wanted to challenge were those that solely focus on the Gulf as being about security. So there's a huge body of geopolitical literature that looks at the Gulf as a kind of a pawn, either in the Cold War or in the post-Cold War world, as a kind of a only and ever a client of the US. And so although the question of colonialism and geopolitics is very central to the arguments that I'm making, I wanted to write about something that was more than that. And finally, the other thing that I really wanted to write about was that in a lot of the literature writing about the Gulf and in particular about Dubai, which is quite an important kind of node in the, in the research and the project, is that they talk about it as being a city of bling, uh, as a city in which you have, you know, shiny uh, skyscrapers and expensive meals and whatnot. And what that, of course, ignores is the long history of, uh, uh, of Dubai as a node of trade and its very rich geography and its you know, the massive communities of migrants and workers who live in that city, which makes it far more than just the city of bling. Um, it was also very important for me to actually look at the history of maritime transportation as starting before the discovery of oil, because again, with a lot of works that are focusing on the Arabian Peninsula, oil tends to be a very central element of this. Um, finally, it was also part of the reason that I didn't just focus on the Gulf, but I also want to include um, Yemen and Oman in this, um, was because for me, it was particularly important to talk about the ways that on the one hand, some of the richest Arab countries, and on the other hand, one of the poorest um, and most beleaguered Arab countries in the region are all on the peninsula. And the ebbs and flows of the economies there, the ebbs and flows of their infrastructural transformation there, this, the way that history traces these ebbs and flows in different ways was something that I thought would be best on display if I included Yemen as well as the Gulf countries. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll begin by talking, um, I'm sure, given the importance and centrality of Hong Kong as one of the global nodes of trade, it's one of the most important ports in the world, the, 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 the sort of the economy of the city emerges in the uh, colonial times, British colonial times, as 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 very in, in ways that are very similar, for example, to the emergence of Singapore as a node of trade and to the development of the Gulf ports. Um, and in fact, Aden also, which is part of the reason why I wanted to include Yemen as nodes of global trade. And so um, what is um, fascinating about uh, the uh, project once I started was how astonishing um, it, the, the scale of this global trade is. So to just give you a sense of some of the statistics, which I, <clears throat> excuse me, write about in my book, um, we know that about 90% of, uh, somewhere between 80 to 90% of world's goods travel by sea. This is, this is both raw materials and produced materials. 30% of all maritime cargo is crude oil. And actually 48% of all global cargo is crude oil and petrochemicals. So natural gas and 
uh, produced petrochemicals. So that's an astonishing percentage if you think about it. What is also fascinating is that um, when we look at containerized cargo, which is of course something familiar to anybody who's been in Hong Kong or Singapore, if you drive by the port, what you see is row after row of containerized cargo. But what is fascinating about um, containerized cargo is that although 70% of world's cargo by value, so by, by cost is containerized. Only 23% by volume is in containers. So what that tells you is the extent to which containerized cargo is about value added to the processes of to, to the processes of production and trade. But what it also tells us is that given that this, this disparity between sort of the value and volume of trade. One of the things that becomes clear is um, that there are entire processes of production, but there are also entire processes of circulation that end up going into adding to this value. Because obviously, um, while we have you know, the value added in production, at every stage, the movement of this cargo ends up having um, added value to to the to the cost of the pro, the, pro, the products that are being uh, processed. Um, this is, of course, not an argument that I'm making. It comes also from the uh, second volume of Das Kapital, where Marx, when focusing on circulation, um, indicates that if circulation ends up becoming crucial to the processes of production and consumption of the goods, it has to be the work that is done on board the ships or trains, is the example that he actually gives, um, for the transportation of goods has to be included in the ways in which we look at the processes of emergence and, and um, trade in goods. So circulation ends up being really important. But of course, circulation is not only those ships that are transporting or rail or car, um, uh, cars, trucks, roads that um, transport the goods. It is also the fixed infrastructures that end up being incredibly crucial to the making of uh, global trade. And those fixed infrastructures are, of course, harbors on the one hand, um, so port cities um, and the specific harbors into which the ships could emerge, but also also, um, the, uh, the, the supporting infrastructure that allows for goods to, uh, that arrive in one particular place to actually emanate from there and go in other directions. So roads being important to those, rail being important to those, but also subsidiary or, se or secondary ports are quite important to those. And part of why the Arabian Peninsula is fascinating is because, of course, in Arabian Peninsula, you have on the one hand a set of ports that export crude oil, so enormously crucial in terms of sending out the material that is that lights up the operations um, of both energy and production in the world. But also it includes entrepot or transit ports. And those among the most important in those are, of course, uh, the port of Jabal Ali in Dubai, which appears as being the number nine or number 10 largest port in the world, often uh, on a list of ports that are only in East and Southeast Asia. So um, of the top 10 ports, Jabal Ali ends up being quite an important one. But also there are a number of other transit ports in the region that, um, for example, the port of Salalah in Oman is another transit port and Abu Dhabi is aspiring to that. And Jeddah is this aspiring to that in Saudi Arabia. And so the, the Arabian Peninsula becomes a fascinating space for studying these, these entrepot trades. Now, uh, again, these were um, these were all sort of the starting dry data that I started with when I was starting to look at the Arabian Peninsula. But of course, then you begin to dig in, and some of what we some what, some of what I found um, are the material, the historical material, the long durée of tra this transformation of the infrastructures, which I thought were actually quite crucial um, in understanding how it is that Arabian Peninsula has become the space that it has. So allow me to begin by telling the story of Aden first, and then by, by switching from the story of Aden into how Dubai rose to be the port that it is, I will indicate some of the transformations that have happened to the maritime infrastructures in the Arabian Peninsula. 
As you might know, uh, the Port of Aden, um, which had been um, a millennia, uh, a millennium ago or a millennia ago, had been quite an important node of trade, had fallen to some extent to, to some disrepair by the 17th and 18th century. At the beginning of the 18th century, as the British um, began to expand their empire in the Indian Ocean, the government, the British government of Mumbai, that was looking for a coaling station. Now, why was it looking for a coaling station? It's because in the, in the um, third or fourth decades of the 19th century, the East India Company began to switch its ships from sailing ships to um, steamships. And so in order to be able to support those ships, traversing the distance from Europe around the Cape of Good Hope or through the Mediterranean and overland and then again on the ship because of, of course the Suez Canal had not yet been dug. Um, it needed coaling stations for its steamships. Uh, it needed places where coal could be transported to and where ships could refuel. And what is really interesting is that a number of the different entrepot ports that end up emerging on the route from um, uh, from Britain to India actually emerge, be first begin to emerge as these coaling stations. So, uh, for example, St. Helena, for example, um, uh, Malta, um, and of course, also, in, rather interestingly, um, Singapore eventually becomes one of these coaling stations. Aden was particularly significant in this regard because, of course, its location on the Indian Ocean, um, but also as um, a kind of a center point, center distance between um, the uh, between Europe and Asia, and also, of course, as the colonization of Australia happens, also as a kind of a node of transportation to Australia, Aden ends up becoming really quite important in that regards. There were several other reasons why Aden was significant. Um, it had a very hospitable harbor. It had a harbor that was um, deep, naturally deep, um, and it had a uh, sort of a hard uh, bottom. And so it ne needed not be dredged all the time in order for larger ships to arrive into that harbor. But also what was important about Aden was that it was a city that actually included quite a lot of um, skills in, um, uh, in seafaring. Um, and it had um, a, a, a extensive interconnections to some of the cities of Indian Ocean. And these extensive interconnections, of course, ended up growing under the British Empire. These extensive interconnections were um, connections of kinship as migrants from the Hadramaut and from Aden itself had um, migrated to various other locations in the Indian Ocean, for example, Singapore, Malaysia, um, and Indonesia. But it was also, um, it was also quite significant because um, there were uh, uh, establishments, uh, sort of credit establishments and communities um, of uh, trade that existed across the Indian Ocean. So the colonization of Aden in 1838 by the British essentially establishes a British beachhead on the Arabian Peninsula. Now, fast forward a um, hundred or more years to the 20th century. And what we see is that in the height of British colonization uh, in, um, in, in Aden itself, um, after the Second World War, Aden had become the world's fourth largest oil fuel um, port. So this is in the 1960s, um, where it had been a huge coaling station after New York um, and uh, London and Liverpool, it also became an enormously important uh, oil fueling uh, bunkering for ships. In part, this was aided by the fact that the British Petroleum had set up a refinery there. So what you end up seeing is that there is supporting infrastructure, in this case, a refinery, ends up being quite crucial to the, to the life of the Aden E port. But there was also another reason why the, Aden, the port of Aden was so significant, which because in the intervening 100 years, 
years, an enormous amount number of merchants, in particular from India, but also from Britain itself, and from the east coast of Africa had settled there. And so you had a very thriving kind of a trade, which allowed people to interconnect, to, to use Aden to connect to the um, to, to the Indian Ocean world, the east coast of Africa, um, the um, uh, Asia, South Asia, and of course onwards um, uh, to to the rest of the um, to the rest of the Indian Ocean. What was also fascinating about Aden was that it was also a landing uh, site for a uh, telegraph and telegraph cables, undersea telegraph cables. And of course, that to some extent also then made it an important hub for telecommunication, because of course, um, until radio transmission comes about in mid 20th century, the telegraph was the primary mean of communication between different areas of the world. And of course it made, the telegraph also made it quite crucial, crucially significant actually in um, deciding which places would become important hubs in part because of their location. Again, Aden had this location as a, tra as a cable landing site halfway between uh, Europe and uh, South Asia, but it was also important um, because um, because because the because of the way that it could be controlled uh, as a colonial outpost of the British, its security the security of those cable landing sites could be controlled. And I think that that has the kind of politics of the cable landing site, which is deeply interwoven with the politics of maritime transport transportation, not only because it supports the sort of strategic um, reasons we have maritime transportation, both commercial and um, military, but also because um, of the fact that it allows for communication. So the, the, the knowing of the costs, knowing of tariffs, knowing of needs for particular products and cargoes in certain places, of course, bolsters um, the need for it, it, it feeds into and reinforces the need for maritime transportation. We see that exact same kind of process happening with internet cables today. And so the, the global politics of um, telegraph in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century is in many ways similar to the politics around under, underwater internet cables, where there is a struggle about which places they will go to, which places will, be, will become landing sites. And of course, um, that the, the way that these um, telegraph and now internet cables follow trade routes. But what also begins to happen in the 20th century, in mid 20th century, is an anti-colonial struggle in Aden in particular against the British, um, which is of course part of the larger anti-colonial ferment in a lot of the world. And, um, and what we find is that as this anti-colonial struggle begins, uh, the British begin to wonder about what they're going to do in terms of the Aden having been this quite significant node of trade, in what ways are they going to be able to use this uh, transit port, what is going to happen to, for example, all of the finance, maritime finance infrastructures, maritime insurance infrastructures, um, and not just fueling, but also the entirety of sort of maritime uh, uh, support mechanisms, which had been established there. And of course, by 1967, um, the Yemenis end up uh, successfully overthrowing uh, the colonial uh, regime there and they go independent. And what one sees is an immediate shift, not only in banks, finance, merchant houses, but also in routes of trade to friendlier to the British ports in the Gulf. And so one begins to see the movement of those banks, the movement of those trade infrastructures, the movement of those maritime uh, businesses from Aden to Dubai. So end of colonialism spells a transformation, a shift, a seesawing on the Arabian Peninsula between Aden and Dubai. Now, colonialism, British colonialism in the Gulf countries, in the, in the Gulf peripheral states, and the US, uh, one could say, imperial um, interests in Saudi Arabia um, are in many ways inseparable from the history of oil there. 
But the British interest in the Gulf countries actually goes further back. Now, what is that interest? Um, of course, as I said, because of the centrality of communication and trade, and particularly of India, when it was an imperial holding of the British, um, intervening points were always, the, the British needed intervening points for their communication. And of course, they needed to um, uh, secure their own trade routes. Um, of course, what was what has always been significant about the British Empire, British Overseas Empire, has been the way that it has married those strategic and military interests or for the dominance of a British Empire with its trade and commercial interests. Those two things have always been interconnected. The East India Company was well known because it could because its uh, hold uh, the ships holds could hold a great deal of cargo, but they were also um, they had cannons which they could protect that. So that that intermarriage between commerce and trade was something that was quite familiar from the moment in which the maritime empire of the British had extended over the globe, and in that. The Trucial Coast, the tr uh, and it's called Trucial Coast because they were treaty ports in uh, the um, in <coughs> the, the Gulf in particular, but also um, in other places, for, um, where it ended up becoming incredibly central to the expansion of British trade in the world. Of course, I don't have to mention treaty ports to colleagues in Hong Kong, in part because, of course, treaty ports were also an instrument of British colonialism in Asia itself. And those forms of those treaty ports emerged, they essentially, it, it, using different kinds of languages and using different kinds of practices, essentially what they did was secure a foothold and often also preferential trade treatment for a the particular kind of European, uh, for the particular European power that had entered a treaty with those particular ports. What it also translated into um, was enormous coercive control of those ports by the, by, by the, by the colony. And of course, we see that, um, that same method being replicated in, along the ports of the Gulf in um, at the Persian slash Iranian uh, Arabian Gulf in um, in uh, the at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, what these treaty ports essentially indicated was that the British realized the significance of some of these ports for the regional trade, um, the the ports in uh, Bahrain and in Kuwait. In Sharjah, to some extent, uh, to some extent, far more significantly than Dubai at the end of the 19th century, and in Jeddah. And of course, the port of Muscat in Oman, all of these were quite important ports of regional trade, regional not only in the Arabian Peninsula, but also across the water to Iran and what eventually becomes Pakistan. Of course, it was India. And of course, also down the coast all the way to East Africa. And so being able to control these ports was quite significant. There are a number of wonderful scholars that have written about this. Um, Johan Matthews um, account uh, being one of the most significant. Um, but the colonial, uh, so, so the colonial power of the British predated the oil. Oil ends up becoming really quite important in the 1930s. And so the protection of sending out of the oil out of these areas, the protection of trade there, um, uh, of trade in oil, the, the sort of the establishment of tanker terminals, in, in turn requires the expansion of cargo terminals. Because if you're going to be setting up uh, an entire infrastructure to, to extract oil, to, to bring in oil pumps, to bring in well mechanisms, to bring in refineries, um, you're going to have to have cargo ports because of course this material wasn't being produced on the Arabian Peninsula itself. So you needed to have cargo ports that allowed for this, these goods to be imported. And so what you end up seeing is that already existing smaller cargo ports that used to serve the entirety of the region end up expanding in this period in order to serve the um, uh, to serve the oil industry. And so what we see is the emergence of this history and the establishment of, of, a, of a set of sort of normative laws and regulations um, of the establishment of coercive forms of control, uh, finance, etc. in all of these places. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions about um, the aspects of the, tr the transformation of the colonial period, but I'm going to now slowly segue into uh, talking about labor.
So one of the things that emerges, of course, I talked about decolonization in Aden, but one of the things that emerges in the 1960s in response also to the British control of these ports and, and the sort of the, the um, expansion of these ports as important and significant, both uh, crude export ports, but also as major cargo ports in these places, um, is the struggles that are going on in, in, in not only in Yemen or in Aden itself, but also in um, the um, city states um, of the Gulf. Um, we see massive forms of um, mobilization that emerge um, in Saudi Arabia, of course, among workers on the oil fields, which uh, in, in working for Aramco, which at the time was owned by uh, American um, companies that eventually American oil companies that eventually become Chev Chevron um, and of course and Texaco itself um, and these massive protests on the oil fields spill over also into the ports. So you, you see um, uh, protests in um, the, the ports of Dahran and Dammam, you see protests in Jeddah. Um, and of course, the response to that is a banning of labor protests in the um, late 1950s. What we also see is that in many of the the Gulf ports, but also in Aden and uh, the ports of Oman, you see labor struggles that are emerging, not only in the oil fields, but specifically in the docks. And what is really fascinating about it is that while some of these struggles are around bread and butter issues, some of these are about wages, some of these are about working conditions, the vast majority of them are actually political struggles about democratizing not only the workplace, but also actually the, the communities in those places. And so what we see is enormous amounts of labor struggles, um, movements emerging in um, places like Bahrain, in Kuwait, um, uh, to a lesser extent in Dubai and Sharjah, extensively in Aden, uh, and eventually also extensively in Oman. And what, what and, uh, forgive me, and also Qatar and Abu Dhabi, actually, these are quite important. And one of the things that came as a major surprise to me when I was doing my research was the extent to which the forms of labor struggle um, were uh, uh, considered to be a threat by the British um, who controlled some of these places. Um, and of course, uh, part, part of the reason that the British considered these a threat was because they were worried about the ways in which these labor struggles in very large scale firms, whether they were in shipping or oil, British Petroleum or some of the docking, uh, some of the shipping companies, um, threatened the uh, not only the flow of oil, but also the strategic dominance of the British in those places. Um, it threatened the, uh, many of these struggles, very specifically named specific British advisors and officials who were involved in this. And I think that this was actually one of the factors that leads to the, 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 the sort of the weakening of British colonial hold and its eventual um, uh, relinquishing of colonial control of these um, states. Um, one of the other things that's fascinating about this is the extent to which the degree of labor struggle in these places in um, on the docks happens because of linguistic um, familiarity and cultural familiarity, because up until the late 1960s and early 1970s, the vast majority of the workers who worked on these docks and or worked um, in the oil fields and who engaged in protests were Arabic speakers who came to the countries of the Gulf from places like Palestine or Syria, Egypt or Iraq um, and Jordan. Um, and even in places like Somalia, for example, where there were a lot of Somalis working on the docks in Aden, um, there was a sort of a linguistic and cultural famili familiarity because of the long-standing um, movement of people between Somalia and Aden. Um, and one of the things that in my book I talk about is the specific strategies that the British and the Americans use in order to uh, break down these forms of Arab worker solidarity. Part of the reason is because, of course, um, it was very difficult for these uh, large firms to fire Arab workers, particularly if they were citizens of Arab nationalist states. So it was very difficult and very specifically, um, they could not, they did not feel that they could, for example, fire um, or deport or punish workers from Egypt or, um, or Syria, in part because of concerns about the way that this would play out geopolitically 
um, and because of the the power in the 1960s and until er, early in the 1970s, these Arab nationalist states held. So that was one of the things that was interesting. The second thing, as I said, was linguistic solidarity. And one of the ways that the British address this is it, it's in the documents that I write about is to specifically transform and socially engineer the labor forces in those places. And one of the ways they do this is by reducing the number of Arab workers and increasing the number of South Asian workers that are arriving there and ensuring that the uh, South Asian and Southeast Asian workers, in part in order to ensure that some of that linguistic uh, solidarity is broken down, in part because the countries that were sending these migrants from South and Southeast Asia were not as insistent on the rights of these workers as, for example, the Egyptian government under um, uh, under Nasser was. And so, um, so there, are, there are very specific documents where the British specifically talk about changing the complexion of the workers there. A final way in which worker struggles are scuppered by the British, um, but which tend to, and, and which we see the effects of today, is, um, is the role of the unions. So in the early, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the British see unions as a way to stop, for example, the influence of communists or Arab nationalists there, because they see unions as being conciliatory bodies. So they actually encourage the establishment of unions in Bahrain and in, uh, to some extent in Kuwait and, and also in Aden. What, of course, they don't understand is the way that these unions end up being actually absorbed by the anti-colonial movements, whether they were socialist or nationalist. And so only if 10 years after they had established, they had encouraged the establishment of these unions, they actually stop they, they start discouraging unions because they see them becoming vehicles for mobilization. And where there were unions, the British advise um, uh, the, uh, the governments and the bureaucracies there about not allowing those unions, for example, to recruit migrant workers. So again, in, in the book, I have a specific example of where Kuwaiti workers are talking about how if they cannot bring in, the, if they cannot recruit among migrant workers, that in essence, this is going to be, and they use the word apartheid, an apartheid system in the labor force. And the British are like, oh, no, nah, it's okay. You just, you can't recruit migrants. And so what we see is in, even in places, unions are banned in most of the Arabian Peninsula with the exception of Yemen. And even when they are not banned, they tend to be very limited to uh, citizen workers number one, and also to state-owned enterprises rather than to private firms. And so this is, this is an after effect of the British modalities of union establishment. Of course, what we see is that the labor struggles keep going on. They, they go on on the docks, they go on on the, on the seas, um, uh, on board the ships. And so, the, so you have these localized mechanisms that scupper labor struggle, and then you have global mechanisms. Uh, and I'll briefly mention one of them before moving on to the question of war. Of course, the global mechanism is flags of convenience. Flags of convenience is a way in which um, ships uh, are and ships that end up being um, placed um, in um, uh, sh ships are being registered under flags of countries which have laxer uh, laws around labor and environmental uh, protections. And so we see also the shifting of a lot of the maritime uh, sort of, um, the, of the ships, of the maritime transport mechanisms to these forms of offshoring, um, which of course massively reduce um, the number of workers, uh, sorry, massively reduce the number of rights that workers have access to. Okay, so, so we have these global and local mechanisms of controlling labor struggles, and we see these labor struggles continue to emerge. And of course, they, they, they come to fruition through the process of decolonization. However, and I think uh, this is also quite important to note, is that the end of colonialism and this kind of fermenting of, um, of uh, labor mobilization does not spell the end of kind of imperial modalities of control. So one of the things that we see, for example, is the continuation of the sort of the importance of uh, European expertise, European laws, European modalities of finance, European standards, European, I should say, North Atlantic standards in the way 
way that these businesses are conducted on board the ships. And we still continue to see, to some extent, labor hierarchies at the apex of which sit Europeans. And then you have middle management, which are increasingly actually from countries um, in the East uh, and Southeast and South Asia. Um, and then, of course, you have the um, layer of workers beneath who have very few rights, who, who still suffer sort of the results of the kinds of social engineering of labor that happened in the 1960s and 70s, and who don't have access to, for example, unionization, collective bargaining, or even the ability to protest. And so this, this continuation of these modalities is also part of what I write about in the book. Finally, and I think throughout all of this, it's really important to also mention the role of war, because, of course, not only have wars of colonization and decolonization that affected the shape um, and contours and location of maritime transportation infrastructures in the Arabian Peninsula, but also um, interstate wars in the region and civil wars. So I mentioned how the decolonization of Aden drove a lot of businesses from, from uh, from uh, Aden to Dubai, and actually, it, the the one can see that chronologically, that actually that that movement results in the flowering of Port Rashid, in which was the major container, major uh, modern port becomes a container port in Dubai, uh, which is um, founded in the early 1970s, and we immediately also see the uh, in uh, the the uh, establishment of Jabal Ali by the end of the decade. So so. Aden ceasing to be a colonial hold, holding translates into these new ports in Dubai. Um, we also see the civil war in Lebanon, which begins in 1975 and goes on until 1991, translates into the shifting of many businesses, including construction firms and maritime finance firm, maritime legal firms, to Dubai and to Bahrain. Again, one can see that chronologically the emergence of Bahrain as a financial center, for example, particularly around questions of maritime insurance and finance, actually follows the civil war in Lebanon. We see the various wars between Israel and the Arab states translating into the shift of businesses into the Gulf. And of course, this is entirely um, in keeping with a Cold War ethos that sees the countries of the Gulf as being prime clients of the US, protected by the British first and then the US in terms of their, their regimes being protected and therefore providing a safe uh, space, if, uh, if uh, one will, for those kinds of businesses that are shifting out of the Arab nationalist states into, into the countries of the Gulf. <clears throat> But it's also actually quite interesting, and I think it's been really important to note, is the way that um, with every war that happens in the region, the, the various Gulf states end up benefiting um, uh, by becoming entrepôts for either the warring states or becoming nodes of logistics, military logistics and transport, going back to the military officer who told me I should be looking at military logistics. These ports end up becoming nodes of military logistics and transport for the warring states. So when, when the Iran-Iraq war goes on between 1980 and 1988, what one finds is that Kuwait ends up becoming an entrepot port for uh, Iraq, Dubai is an entrepot port for Iran, and essentially the transit of goods in and out of those states is moderated through these ports in Kuwait and Dubai. And the Dubai and Kuwait, of course, flourish and they really benefit from being able to be transit ports for these places. Of course, we then also see the Iraqi attack on Kuwait and then the war, the desert storm in uh, early 1990s, uh, 1990 and 1991. Then we see, of course, the various um, sort of US sanctions on Iraq, which are supported by various military actions. And then, of course, the major uh, US war on Iraq in 2000. Uh, three, which um, the US begins to ramp up in 2002. And the effects of this are again a flourishing of businesses in the ports of the Gulf. Um, we see Dubai becoming a central logistics hub for the US war um, 
in particular in Afghanistan, where goods are shipped into Dubai and flown from there to Afghanistan. Uh, we see Kuwait becoming a significant node for um, the transit of fuel, but also military material. We also see the significance of some of the ports on the Gulf, particularly, for example, the port of uh, Jubail, um, in suddenly switching purpose from being a transit port for oil and petrochemicals to being a port uh, uh, essentially for military logistics. One of the stories that I tell in the book is about how when um, the um, it's, a, it's an interview with uh, the police um, uh, chief of Jubail in which he talks about how when the uh, U.S. logistics officers came to Jubail in the run up to the to the war in Iraq to set up shop, that they had better maps of the port and the maritime transport infrastructures than the police chief of the, the, the Saudi police chief of Jabal did. And so that says to me something about the way that these infrastructures end up becoming dual use infrastructures. They become infrastructures that are at once spaces of commerce, but which are, can very easily switch to or be simultaneously and concurrently also ports of, um, for war making. Of course, what emerges out of all of this is the extent to which um, from the colonial era until today, it is impossible to separate out those kinds of military forms and the, those uh, forms of military expansion from, uh, from, from commercial interests. But also, I think what is really important to, to note is that we see shifts now happening. Um, we are shifting from a world which for a time was unipolar with the US, of course, being at the apex. We see the transformation of global trade in ways that we see emergence of China, for example, but also of India um, to challenge these commercial interests. And I think that one of the effects of this, of course, that we see in the Arabian Peninsula, but also across the water on uh, in the Horn of Africa, is the extent to which the local states there are now not only facing uh, the, the sort of the European states, not only facing the US, and Britain, but also increasingly facing East, but also the, the also actually interconnecting with one another. And so one of the fascinating things for me, and one of the things that I write about in, in, the, um, in the book is the conflicts that end up, regional conflicts, commercial conflicts that end up emerging out of this. So the port of Djibouti, for example, um, ends up uh, allowing for a number of countries to establish military bases there. Uh, the, the Americans, the French, um, uh, the Saudis, uh, Dubai, the, the Chinese, the Japanese all have uh, bases there. Um, and what is interesting is the extent to which uh, the Djiboutian uh, government sees the establishment of these bases as guaranteeing its ability to sort of control um, the its commercial side, because of course the port of Djibouti is one of the more important ports. It's again another transit port for the Horn of Africa, but also uses this um, kind of a, um, a, a arbitrage between the strategic power of these different states as a means of challenging regional states. So where, for example, Dubai Ports World Port Management Company um, is seen to engage in commercial malfeasance, uh, the Djiboutian government invites the Chinese to take over. And because of the size of China and because of the government of Djibouti being able to call on these new alliances, it is able to sort of challenge um, the, uh, the, the way that it feels the Dubai ports world, for example, has behaved in its port. This, interconnection between strategic and commercial, between the military um, and trade, uh, between war and commerce is what the book is about and what I pretty much try to show a longer sketch of it over the course of the last um, hundred years of so, or so, but especially since the end of the Second World War. I'll be happy to answer questions because I obviously just covered a little bit of the book. There's a lot more to be said. So please do feel free um, to shoot any, any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Professor Kalini, to present her fascinating research. Now let's move on to the next section, comment and questions. Yeah, if you have questions, and raise your hand. Yeah, 
KTV. Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lele. Um, Lale, I, um, I thought this was really fascinating and actually I'll have several questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, uh, one trend that it seems that, um, that I could kind of see there, but it, I don't think that you mentioned it uh, explicitly, I, and I, so I was curious about it, is the, um, somehow the, it, it's a trend towards the focusing of the, um, of these nodes around city states. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it wasn't so much early on, but if we move from Aden to Dubai and we move from Lebanon to, you know, Abu Dhabi or all these different, all these Gulf um, entities are, City states and is what is it about a kind of a city state entity that um, how would that fit into all of these different changes and how does that facilitate um, all of these negotiations and um, geopolitical uh, you know situations within these geopolitical kind of trans and, and transformations. What a fabulous question. I think in a sense, part of the reason that these places are city states is also because of that colonial history. So it's a, almost a circular <laughs> circular thing where the emergence of, for example, um, Hong Kong, which was, you know, it, in a way it's own city state, Singapore, mm. a kind of a city state, um, uh, Dubai and Sharjah city states. Um, in fact, probably reflects that kind of a colonial history of these places as free ports and as entrepreneur ports, um, and also the role that they played as kind of uh, central nodes in the imperial uh, communication and transportation networks that the British had extended across the world. Um, I think part of the reason that city, uh, uh, part of the reason that they are, that they have continued to be significant and functioning as city states is also because of the kind of political machinations of the colonial times where the British, of course, liked to have these particular kinds of units that they could control, which is used as sort of to geographically divide and rule, but also to in order to have kind of beachheads, literally beachheads, um, which they could use for penetration into the hinterlands, but meanwhile also strategically maintaining a kind of a control in those places. So in some in many instances, the, the reason that the city-state form was maintained for quite a long time, um, in fact, until the British themselves left, was because it allowed them some degree of moderation, some degree of attenuation between different states. Um, I tell the story in um, one of the chapters of the book about how uh, when the British were protector, uh, protecting both Sharjah and Dubai um, in the 1950s, they actually very specifically had a policy of allowing the Sharjah port, which had been a thriving port and probably more significant than Dubai in the 1940s, they allowed for its harbor to become silted um, and they essentially wanted trade there to die, in part because the Amir of Sharjah was not as amenable um, of a client as the Amir of Dubai was in the 1950s. And so the Amir of Dubai was being rewarded by an engineering project that allowed for the dredging of the creek and uh, the sort of an emergence of a Doe harbor, whereas the Amir of Sharjah was being punished by allowing his port to sort of sink into um, obscurity. And in fact, they were not able to really actually do the kind of harbor dredging and construction that they wanted to until after independence from the British. So there's something quite interesting and significant about the extent to which the British played off in particular um, city states that were very close to one another against each other in order to be able to extract form concessions from the ruling families there. I also think that there is another reason why city states emerge in this particular way and I think there's a larger story about here and that is that ports tend to have they really generally tend to be very much more outward facing than they are that the connections of between ports even across the water tend to be sometimes stronger than the, uh, the connection of uh, ports to their hinterlands which of course then means the emergence of these kinds of nodes in these particular areas geog more geographically sort of bounded than they would have been otherwise um, and I and I think that that's sort of what we see then is a kind of effect of that we even see effects of that even after the federation for example of the country of the emirates into the into the united arab emirates where the city states have jealously hung on to some of the autonomies that they have had um, 
but we also see the gradual decreasing of that kind of a city-state autonomy with Abu Dhabi, for example, becoming very muscular and robust, both in its security and military adventures, but also by being able to, for example, when in the 2000 and when the country of Dubai, when the city-state of Dubai had financial problems in the 2000s, of being able to rescue um, Dubai. And so we, we do see that in the aftermath of uh, colonial withdrawal, the city-states actually, we see shifts in the way that they are functioning and we see a recession of that, at least in, in the Arabian Peninsula to some extent. Um, but historically they've been important because of that, because of the effect of essentially British colonial control in those places. Yeah, so just to follow up a little bit on that, because what really struck me, and, and I actually, I, I don't know, I hardly know anything about uh, the Arabian Peninsula and um, and uh, so many of the things that you talked about, but, and so I didn't know at all about the story of Aden and the shift uh, to Dubai. Um, but what really struck me about what you were saying about Aden is, um, so there was a national anti-colonial movement um, mm. And it made me think, and then everything moved to Dubai, and it made me think that there's something about the relationship between the, these kind of uh, port city states and the hinterland that is it maybe, um, and it made me think also about the situation in, in Hong Kong and the British colonialism in Hong Kong. Whereas if you have a, a kind of a city state setup, A, you don't need to worry about managing a hinterland, and B, yeah you um the the city is cut off from the nation building and nationalism and this kind of um collective um the construction of a collective subject um and these city state entities can also very flexibly um, navigate between um larger entities and flows and things like that so in some ways it's it, it it's easier to manage like the labor disputes national um Right, so Egypt, all these countries that have nationalism, that doesn't work anymore. But these, but these city states then become purely engaged in the commercial um, orientation, not involved in national struggles. Yeah. Is this? I don't know. If it, I mean, I think that that's a very good um, example, and I and I actually think that that oh, I don't know the uh, story of Hong Kong as much as I do Singapore. And to me, mm -hmm. Singapore actually is a perfect example of that, where it feels mm -hmm. like the city state was hived off from yeah. its hinterland. Precisely because it was, it functioned as such an important sort of an entrepot, free port for the for the for the British, um, and it actually continued to function as that well into the twentieth century because. We also see during the anti-colonial struggle in Malaya, Singapore is this kind of a node of, uh, if you will, commercial and, and military stability for the British. Whereas, of course, there is, you know, next door, there is a massive anti-colonial struggle going on in Malaya, which was, of course, then uh, pacified by the British. But nevertheless, I think your your I, I think that your um, uh, assessment is certainly applicable to the case of um, to the case of uh, uh, Singapore. I think. Um, the city states of um, the Gulf Coast are slightly different in part mm. because they also have uh, be because of the, the sort of the topography there and because of the particular kind of uh, geographic and uh, hi histories there, you do, of course, have a hinterland of, of engaged in agriculture and later, of course, mining and other kinds of things and, and oil extraction. But the longer history of these places is really primarily the history of these ports uh, trading outwards. And one, one, one finds in, in the sort of the histories that go even to the pre-modern times, most of these places were important ports of trade. And I think that that makes it slightly different because it doesn't, because these city states of the Gulf don't have such huge hinterlands as for example, Singapore, or I'm sure Hong Kong do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that also makes a slight bit of a difference there. Um, uh, but, but, I, but, but when we do have in the 1960s, the emergence of anti, uh, emergence of anti-colonial struggles in the Arab world, this, despite the differences, we see the tactics that are being used by the British there are very similar to the tactics that they use in Singapore and sort of the portability of those modalities of control and pacification is mm. certainly, um, you know, something that happens within empires um, and, and the British in particular 
did that, you know, something that worked in one place would be, it would become a modular uh, method that was used in other locations as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have other questions, but I'll wait and see if other people have other things to say first. Oh yeah, actually I have a question for Lily. And yes. I think you give a very fascinating story about about the, the colonial history, but I, I'm wondering, do you have any theoretical contributions or do you engage in any theoretical debate with some of these existing studies? So uh, the broader theoretical debates that I'm interested in actually um, tend to be, tend to run through uh, the, the book and it's not one single overarching theoretical contribution. So one of the one of the first, and I think this is something that emerges quite in, in quite a lot of the uh, the, argue, uh, the the sort of the latter parts of the um, uh, book is is actually something that challenges Rontier state theory because of course the Rontier state theory is that your states what they end up doing is they have oil they bribe you know, whatever. And that essentially um, means that you will not have uh, forms of protest. You know, this structure is entirely structured around oil. And part of what the book tries to do is to show that actually pre-existing sort of institutional mechanisms that predated oil end up being quite important, number one. And number two is Rosie oh. Bashir. And sorry. Um, um, we've lost the sound. Hmm? Can you Can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so part of part of what um, uh, I also want to show, as Rosie Bashir and others have shown, is that modalities of protest are actually not um, yeah, that 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 sort of an oil bribe, which is so central to the Rantier state theory, is definitely not um, significant you know, as, as, as a mode of control. Um, there's also arguments that I engage in having to do in particular in Middle East studies around questions of whether union organization were about bread and butter issues or they were about sort of transformations in politics, which I, on that one, I hedge my bets and I say both. Um, and finally, there are some sets of arguments within, for example, um, studies of logistics and supply chains, mm. um, which are which are interested in kind of the importance of sites of production. Mm. Uh, and part of what I argue is actually that site, while sites of production might be important, the framework around which capital accumulation, uh, the, the framework that frames capital accumulation, so sets of uh, legal accounting and production standards, engineering standards, um, of sort of form of technological technological exchange etc um, are still emanating from the north atlantic and so that the, the so, so on the one hand you can have the distribution of capital accumulation in parts of the world but you still have the, that that uh, we might be in a period of transition, but the majority of those things still emanate from uh, the North Atlantic. And so I think that that's also quite significant. And finally, um, there's, of course, a lot of within Marxist sort of circles, there's a lot of debates about whether empire is about you know, sort of valuation of capital, or is it about strategic? And on that one, I kind of fall with Rosa Luxemburg, who says that the accumulation of capital that happens within empires is always done at the point of a gun. And so she refuses to, to separate those. And I, and I hope that um, sort of the empirical stuff that I offer um, show that to some extent. But my aim was actually to also write something that was very um, sort of approachable and accessible to a larger audience. So the kinds of theoretical arguments that I make in there, I make with a very light touch and allow people to come to those conclusions by reading the book rather than, because I, I wanted to tell a lot of stories. And, and in fact, I wanted people who had no interest whatsoever in the Arabian Peninsula or in logistics or supply chains to actually go and read the book. And so I think I wrote it in such a way that allows for that accessibility. Um, but, but I do make those kinds of, I, I do take a position in those theoretical arguments. It's just that I do it without as I, like in my first two books, you know, you do that thing where I argue and I, this is what the literature says and this is what I do. I don't do that in this one. No, so, no. <laughs> but it was kind of more fun to write for that reason. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Sure. I read your book. Oh, did you? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. What did, did you, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. Okay. Good. Excellent. Thank you. thank you. Yes, David. 
Right. So to actually, um, so I guess my um, my next question is, um, uh, what does this all of this study um, mm -hmm. tell us about um, how we could see the increasing role of China in the whole yeah. region? Um, because obviously, what you show is um, that. Uh, the role of so if we look at the British Empire and we we sh we see how how the importance of ports um, sub, um, these infrastructures of trade building all of this up is really um, what the empire is in a sense what it's all about and it has the British Empire has its own particular modality of doing that then the American Empire has its own kind of modality uh, of doing that. This then has these, it brings uh, into play these issues of labor um, and uh, the management of the populations that are working in these ports and infrastructures, which then leads to the issue of how do you maintain the, um, how do you actually securitize all of this? So the issue of mm -hmm. war or military control. So, um, so now we have a new player coming in, which is now, um, uh, has its own modality of ports and um, um, shipping and things like that, and then is starting to eventually have to deal with the issue of the people who work there and how you securitize it all. So what are your thoughts on how that, um, is there a special, do the Chinese have a different modality or how does it all play into this? Um, yeah. So it's quite interesting because I think the Chinese have, um, different modalities um, in different places that they're going to. And in part, uh, I think it is that that is an effect of sort of the longer standing history of the Chinese. So in the Southeast Asia, where Southeast Asia is sort of their neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, they tend to sort of interact differently than they would in East Africa. And they certainly, um, one of the things that has been fascinating for me is the way that the BRI seems to studiously avoid the Arabian Peninsula. It's sort of, oh. the, uh, yes, so I there thought, are no, yeah, yeah. So what, one, so one of the interesting things is that the infrastructure projects that the that that kind of form part of the BRI um, really don't. None of them really appear on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, yeah. They all sort of circumnavigate it. So you see, for example, the port of Gwadar in Pakistan. Yeah. Um, you see. Of course, Djibouti, you see other kinds of infrastructure projects, um, railways on the Horn of Africa. You see, of course, infrastructure projects um, uh, elsewhere in even in uh, Iran. And but but what you don't see are thus far anyway, infrastructure projects on the Arabian Peninsula. That to me has been fascinating, but one one also looks at the sort of the interaction of Chinese capital, whether state owned or private enterprises or sort of semi in between, um, the and the relationship actually with these uh, with with the sort of the maritime transport infrastructure complexes, is the extent to which Chinese capital, again state or private, tends to operate through local relationships, so um, and draws on local sets of knowledges. So Chinese uh, expansion in East Africa, for example, uses uh, some of the mining projects, for example, that are emerging, uses a security, logistic security firm based out of Abu Dhabi, but which is on, which uh, is actually invested, uh, has investments by Hong Kong investors uh, and is actually listed uh, on this Hong Kong stock market, so on the Hong Kong stock, uh, stock exchange. So you have this security firm that's based out of Abu Dhabi. It's actually, and the owner of it is um, a, a sort of a former US Navy SEAL. And so his, he provides uh, Eric Prince, actually. Um, so, 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 so you have that in terms of secure logistic security. But you also have, for example, a lot of the Chinese firms that set up shop in the Dubai International Finance Finance Center, which is essentially a free zone for banking. And again, draw on the expertise in Dubai and other places to do that kind of investment. You see Chinese firms obviously involved in port management in a lot of these places. So Hutchinson um, and others are involved in port management, but the, inf the, the sort of the large scale infrastructure projects that have sort of characterized BRI in the Indian Ocean 
um, you don't see them to this. Uh, there's nothing comparable to it on the Arabian Peninsula. So to me, what's interesting about that is the extent to which Chinese capital here operates hand in hand with, but also very cautiously around the interests of the Arab capital in the Gulf. In the peripheries around the Gulf, however, um, to me, it's fascinating that the only Chinese military base outside of sort of the China, South China Sea um, area is actually in Djibouti, which says something about the extent to which China obviously places an importance on protecting its routes of trade to Europe, because obviously the Djibouti um, sitting on Bab al-Mandab it's that's where 12% of the you know global trade goes through the Suez Canal. And so I think that that to me is quite fascinating. Um, there's also, and again, the way that China operates and the emergence of China as a global power is different in these different places. So in some places in East Africa, where they have large scale maritime transport, maritime and land transportation um, infrastructures, there's massive struggles that are going on um, against um, the, their local sort of labor uh, organizations and unions and whatnot, which feel that the Chinese don't necessarily, the Chinese infrastructure projects don't necessarily have good working conditions or don't even hire locals or put when they hire locals, they're placed in inferior positions to sort of the Chinese engineers. In other places, you see actually a lot more care given to that those sets of relations. And so I think to me, the unevenness of the Chinese expansion in all of these places says something about the continued significance of those pre-existing sets of relations which shape, um, which shape uh, the BRI actually. Um, and, Talking, I'm not a I'm not a big China expert, but I've talked to China, friends who are big experts on Chinese trade, and um, essentially what they would argue is that what the BRI has done is taken a whole series of disparate existing sets of trade and other kinds of relations, strategic, et cetera, and place them all under the same heading, making it seem to have much more coherence than it does. And by just looking at the way that it operates in various countries of the Arabian Peninsula versus, for example, Pakistan versus, for example, the East Coast um, of Africa or the Horn of Africa, one can see how that is indeed the case. <laughs> as, as to where it goes in the future, I, I don't dare predict <laughs> because there seems to be so many interesting factors that could be going on, which has to do with what goes on in China itself, which what goes on with COVID, goes on with the transformations in global trade, which goes on, you know, to trade wars that are happening, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot that is going on, which is um, which could shape what might happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So who still has questions? If people are shy about asking questions in person, I'm quite happy to receive questions by email. So <laughs> please do feel free. I'll, I'll put down my email address in the, um, in the chat box. Yeah. And I would invite anyone who'd like to have a chat or have questions to please email me. So while we're waiting to see if anybody else uh, will send something. So my next question is, so in all of your account, so where, how does religion fit, fit into it? Or how do these changes that you've uh, described, how do they affect religion or how are they affected by religion? So interestingly, I think religion fits into it um, very uh, in, in a very superficial sort of way, in part because I think that, um, uh, with the exception of Saudi Arabia, uh, the the vast okay, actually maybe I'll uh, attend, uh, maybe I'll change that. Um, with the exception of Saudi Arabia, religion tends to have very various kinds of effects in most of these places. Where in the Arabian Peninsula you see sectarian, the uses 
and uh, creation of sectarian difference as a modality of social control or labor control, then religion becomes more significant. So one of the things that is quite fascinating and significant and must be noted is that um, in Bahrain um, and in the countries of the, what eventually becomes the United Arab Emirates, the Shia population were very, very predominantly represented among the workers. So until the 1970s. And so I think that that resulted in actually that kind of a creation of a sort of a radical ethos among, for example, Shias of Bahrain, um, which uh, dovetailed with also with their recruitment into lefty parties and left wing unions and things like that, which we saw the effects of that actually in the in the, the, the way that that sort of bifurcation um, or, or uh, concentration if sort of labor mobilization actually ended up playing out in the 2001, to, sorry, 2011 Arab uprisings. Um, in some of the other places, those Shia workers, so they, they outnumbered everybody else. Um, a lot of the infrastructures in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi were actually built, for example, by uh, workers that were of Iranian descent going back several centuries. And so th there was also an interesting way in which the sector difference played out in those places. However, what was also what is also worthy of note is that not until like 1980s, um, where Iran's revolution resulted in a kind of a radical posture from Iran towards a lot of these Gulf countries, we don't really see that kind of a sectarian conflict in between the workers, the Shia workers and the non-Shia workers. In terms of um, religion, it's worthy of note that um, obviously there were a huge number of Arabs uh, of various sorts that came to work in these maritime infrastructures. And many of them were actually Christians, particularly if they were coming from, uh, from Lebanon, Syria, or Palestine. And so you did have these sort of Christian Arab nationalists, actually most of them uh, workers who established quite comfortable sort of lives as bureaucrats and technocrats and professionals and whatnot. The working classes were mostly Muslim, but, but you saw those kinds of connections. Of course, with the kinds of labor engineering that one sees happening, um, uh, you, you have the influx of large numbers of workers that are not necessarily um, Muslim anymore, as many of the Arab workers were. So you have, for example, a lot of Indians that are coming in that might be Hindu or Sikh or um, of other religions. You see large numbers of Christians coming from the Philippines and elsewhere. One of the other significant, I think, elements, so, so you see that, but religion, again, with the exception of Saudi Arabia, which sort of in, is insistent on the fact that it has no Christians or Jews or, in, or any other religions within the country itself, or does not really allow for practices of sort of piety there, uh, other than in Islam. This has not been a significant factor. There is one other element, though, of how religion could have affected this story, and I do actually touch on this, and that is the importance of Jeddah as a port of pilgrimage um, before the coming of oil. And so, in a sense, Jeddah was actually the most important port on the Arabian Peninsula before the coming of oil, precisely because it was such a significant uh, sort of an outpost. And it is one of those places where a lot of quarantine practices, a lot of port management practices, a lot of port construction practices, a lot of roads and rail building practices were actually perfected. Um, and it was all because, of course, the, the great sort of the, the festival, um, Fernand Braudel called the Hajj, the great sort of uh, commercial festival, because, of course, it was an enormously important religious moment, but it was also a moment in which people engaged in trade. Um, and so that probably is the most uh, consistent and coherent sort of way in which religion has played a role in, in, in the making of those infrastructures there. <laughs> Oh, that's really interesting. Muhammad says there were performances of conversion imposed on Chinese laborers some 10 years ago in Saudi Arabia, especially in connection to their railway projects in the Hejaz, especially those on the periphery of Mecca. This does not seem operative anymore. And uh, I, I'm not surprised. I think those kinds of performances of um, uh, conversion tended to be important, actually, not just in sort of mass conversion of some workers, but also in individual conversions. And they're like in some of the novels that um, uh, Arabs have written actually about 
the you know going to work in Saudi Arabia in various sectors, they do talk about those sorts of pressures to convert. Um, but it's interesting that it hasn't been significant in the last ten years or so. So if you don't have a question, how about we stop here today? Great. Okay. So uh, thank you again for joining the Brain Face Religion and Empire Lecture Series. We will update our information on website, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, Luna will share with you the links so you can see our programs. And uh, please pay attention to our lecture series. And uh, look forward to seeing you again. And David, do you have still some words to, to say to everyone? Right, I just wanted to say thank you so yeah. much, Lale. This was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, yeah, it was incredibly informative. And in I think it's so, um, you really gave us a completely uh, different way of looking at the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East mm -hmm. and all thank of you. the intertwined, uh, both historically deep, but also uh, highly contemporary intertwined dimensions of colonial governance, labor, labor struggles, and war. And all of this is a story that I think on these three themes uh, will, is continuing and can, will continue to play out uh, in the future. So um, it's very, very enriching for us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Th thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Lunar, for uh, sort of doing an amazing job of organizing everything. And Jules and David for your excellent questions. It, it has been a pleasure to speak with you. And I hope that one day we can sit there and uh, eat together and drink together and have a conversation informally. Indeed. It has been a pleasure. Hope thank you very so much. Fun. Thank you. Thank you.